So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to LSBU's second event for Black History Month 2021. Uh, my name is Neil hudson Basing. I'm the Corporate Events Manager at LSBU. Um, we are delighted to be joined by a spe special guest, Dame Elizabeth Anionwu. Um, welcome to today's event. We are delighted to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're going to be hearing all about your book, Dreams from My, Dreams from My Mother. So very excited to hear that later. Um, Dame Elizabeth is going to be joined in conversation with our very own Professor Calvin Morley. Good afternoon, Calvin. Hi, Neil. Hi. Um, so I'm just going to take you through some virtual housekeeping to start with, starting with a short statement on respect and dignity. Everyone attending or speaking at an LSVU event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. LSVU operates an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We value contributions, feedback and comments and wish to create a space for sharing, learning, celebrating and bringing communities together. LSBU does not tolerate any form of bullying, abuse, harassment or discrimination. Inappropriate behaviour, including that that potentially impacts or contradicts LSBU's reputation and values, will be treated seriously and acted upon. Anyone exhibiting any examples of this behaviour will also be removed from the webinar. We want our events to be an enjoyable, safe and warm experience for all. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. So just to take you through the functionality, we're on Zoom Pro today, which means you can turn your cameras and microphones off on on should you wish to participate in the Q&A later. Um, I'd like to ask you to just keep your microphones on mute um, while the conversation is taking place. And then a bit later, there'll be a chance to ask um, Elizabeth and Calvin any questions, um, as well as engage in some open conversation. Um, please do feel free to use the chat box throughout um, to share your thoughts and comments and um, also use it to introduce yourselves. Um, you'll see that I've enabled closed captioning for this event, which are the subtitles that are appearing on your screen right now. If you don't wish to see them, um, you can hide them by clicking the little up arrow next to CC Live Transcript, um, and you can choose to hide those there, but we do activate those in the interests of inclusivity and accessibility. Um, finally, I'd like to ask you to share your uh, share your thoughts on Twitter. Um, we love to see your comments there, um, and it helps us spread the word um, beyond the event itself. Um, so I have just put our hashtags and our Twitter handle in the chat box. Um, that's all from me. Um, I'm in the background. If you have any other questions, please do ping me a message. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Calvin for a proper welcome and scene setting. Calvin, over to you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, after doing almost 18 months of webinars at home, it's strange to be in my little office doing them. Um, so, so, but it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to welcome Dame Elizabeth. Um, I often say Elizabeth because I met Elizabeth um, many years ago when I did my first academic position at what used to be Thames Valley University. And um, so I've known a lot about Elizabeth and her career. And, you know, sometimes when you know someone and they become your friend, you tend to forget all the things that they have achieved because you just know them as, you know, and then you look back and you think, and I'm really proud today to welcome Elizabeth and look at some of your achievements, Elizabeth, the first sickle cell and thalassemia nurse in Britain and your work around that, um, your campaigning to set up the um, Mary Seacole Centre for Racial Justice and also your work around the Mary Seacal statue at St. Thomas's. I remember that campaign really well. And um, it's wonderful. Um, I remember one of the Mary Seacal Awards when we unveiled the prototype, what it would be like. And there was such a wonderful celebration around that. So, um, and, and you know, there are so many other achievements you have that we're gonna talk about today. Um, <clears throat> but really and truly thank you for spending time with us today and having this little conversation. But, and your converse, the conversation is really about this book, okay? Um, Dreams from my mother. And um, yes, I got it. I read it. I've been reading and underlining as I go along ideas and themes that resonate also with me and probably with some of our, the people in our audience today. They may want to ask you questions around that. But before we go into your book, really, Elizabeth, you would have heard in the news recently that we have a national shortage of nurses in the UK. Dare I say the magic number, 50,000, you know. Um, how would you promote nursing as a profession today from your experience to attract people into the profession? <clears throat> well, I, I, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I'm retired and I've obviously been watching what's been going on in lockdown and then partial lockdown. And one thing that has struck me is 
and certainly from social media as well, is my impression that the role of nursing has come out very, very strongly through this tragic um, pandemic. And um, so on the one hand, I am hearing that there are more people coming into nursing, mm -hmm. but I think we're seeing the shortfall in the, uh, of those in practice, but Calvin, you, you would know better than me. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, it's it's but, very complex, isn't it, Calvin? It really it, is. It, it is complex, but I'm sure you've had some nuggets of great experiences in this in your career that allowed you to, you know, blossom as a nurse. You yes. know, those things that were really rewarding and satisfying as a nurse. I, I mean, I've always uh, said I've never regretted choosing nursing as a career, but there's no doubt that if nurses aren't paid adequately, however fulfilling it is, people still have to survive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a mismatch going on there. Uh, 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 nursing is fulfilling, mm -hmm. but you still have to survive. Uh, that's really all, all I can, I'm <laughs> summing it up in those two ways, Calvin, yeah. honestly. Uh, yes, I, I remember once saying to my mother-in-law that, um, you know, I said, Joe, we're not, we're not angels with halos. We have mortgages to pay and, you know, lives to live <laughs> and families to support. Because mm -hmm. um, she always had this idea of nurses as, you know, angels that glided around uh, through we're, the we're hospital. We're human beings, aren't we? We're human exactly. beings. Exactly. Yes. Uh, Elizabeth, so before we come to Dreams from My Mother, which I really enjoyed reading, um, your first book was entitled Mixed Blessings from a Cambridge Union. And it's really probably, would you say it's the prequel to this book? Yes, so the, 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 <clears throat> there's two key differences. The first is that Mi Mixed Blessings from a Cambridge Union, I self-published it, Calvin. Mm. I just, you know, I quite like doing the odd project and I, I Mary Seacole's statue had been unveiled in 2016, so mm. about a, nine months before we sort of thought it definitely is going to happen after all the ups and downs as you know it took nearly 13 years i'm sure we'll talk about that later mm. but so, so it probably was 2015 that i had been asked by friends and colleagues who started to learn about my early difficult life as a child mm. how on earth you know that it wasn't the usual narrative. It was a successful narrative. Mm -hmm. And people said it was an inspiring narrative. And that I had some friends who would just say to me, Elizabeth, I think you really should, you need to write about your life. And so <clears throat> honestly couldn't, I knew I had a good story, Calvin, mm -hmm. but honestly couldn't be bothered contacting publishers. So there's a slightly lazy side of me but there's also a shy side of me. And there's also a side of me that I didn't want to experience rejection slips from publishers. Come on, I'm, I'm being very honest. And I thought, and I looked into self-publishing. I thought, oh, actually, that, that looks quite, quite interesting to do it that way. So <clears throat> the title of Mixed Blessings from a Cambridge Union really describes how I came into the world, basically. I was um, the, the outcome of an affair of my parents whilst they were students at Cambridge University. One was white, one was black. There you go, mixed. And I think I am a blessing <laughs> because I actually, I'm a slight um, tongue in cheek there, but I was very conscious of the very traumatic stories that certain people have had who have been in care, who looked after particularly Oh, not, not particularly, but my experience was within the Catholic Church. Yeah. Uh, it was a Catholic-run children's home. And we know that there have been some dreadful, dreadful experiences, physical, sexual, all sorts of abuse that uh, individuals have experienced. I, you know, I'm not saying that I didn't have problems, and I set out some of the problems in my memoirs, but overall... Um, when I, so the mixed blessings is, 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 is to try and sort of balance <clears throat> positive and negative experiences and that overall um, I'm not a woman of faith but I use the term blessings for all sorts of reasons so mixed blessings from a Cambridge Union was to try and set out my own narrative of despite all the difficulties that my mother encountered that I encountered as particularly as a child 
and as a teenager, things did turn out all right on the whole. So that's that's where that title came from, um, Calvin. Yeah. And, and I, I think it, it's really interesting, people who are reading Dreams from My Mother, they really need to go back also and read, you know, your, your first book, as I say, you know, the, the mixed blessings and such. Um, but in Dreams of Your Mother, I was really um, taken back, there's a chapter about the Cambridge life, mm. in which you, you know, you write about your mother's experience, you know, a woman at that time, you know, trying to get in for where she wanted to be. Um, but can you tell us about your experience as a black woman in this education? How much does Elizabeth's experience differ from mom's experience? You know, or oh, the similarities? I think there's a huge difference. The first mm. being that mm. my mother felt that she couldn't have an academic career mm. as a single mother and, that, and a mother of a brown skinned child. And although she was, there was pressure put on her to go back to university after she'd had me. Um, there was some pressure put on her to have me adopted or long-term fostering. She, so she had all these forces, I would say, that were against her. Whereas, you know, I'm, I, I w was a single mother. Now I completed my nursing course, which wasn't in, which wasn't university linked when I did it, it was, the, it was the late 60s. So I was in that group of nurses that did the state registered nurse course in a school of nursing that was attached to a hospital and not a university. So I didn't have that initial university experience that my mother did because uh, she was at Cambridge University for two years, virtually two years before she dropped out. Whereas for me, I, I was a late entry, if you like, into academic life. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's some differences there. The other difference though, if I had become pregnant as a student as a, at, at, at a university doing my nursing, I think there are more resources and support available um, that would enable me to still be a single mother. It, obviously, it's with great difficulty. We realise students um, in that situation, it's, it's, it's not easy for them. However, the big difference is they could, they, they can complete a course and still be a single mother or single parent. So there's a huge difference in terms of attitudes towards, I mean, you know, the term was illegitimacy, you know, it's... Yes unlawful <laughs> the book. yes I, you know, so, I see that word popping up all the time in the book yes yes and, that's what it was called and then there was the term half cast you know because of yeah. course actually what made me write my memoirs in the end that really pushed me was uh, I wanted to find photographs of my child of myself as a child because I only had a couple of photos and I love imagery and I love photography mm -hmm. And so I approached the children's home and in their archives, they didn't have any photographs of me, but they had this folder full of papers, starting from when my grandparents, my grandfather approached the Catholic church when my mother was six months pregnant and going on until I left the children's home at the age of nine in the, in the late 1950s. Well, I mean, come on, this is primary, primary source this is primary evidence isn't it Calvin yes, it is. I mean you know we're all evidence-based aren't we we all want that <laughs> original material we don't really want the second hand third hand mm -hmm. and here I was presented with a dossier of first hand primary mm -hmm. information and I just felt I couldn't waste that information and although I didn't have the photographs mm -hmm. I had this documentation and that's actually what in the end made me decide to write my memoirs I realized I had this incredible material to draw yeah. from yeah I, I, and and it's, it's interesting you know two points um just in right now to make is that you <clears throat> the the letters exchanged by your grandfather to reverend mm -hmm. flint who played mm -hmm. a, a really important and and you see that relationship growing over yes. the years as your as your mother's pregnancy developed right. you know until you were right. born even you know I, 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 I that whole relationship with the church and you know the, the home and such so that, that was the sort of you, deferential really well the, the, the deferential tone between my grandfather and, and and my mother later on and and the, 
he became canon in the end, didn't yes. he? But yes, the he sense did. of urgency, mm. you know, my family were desperate to get this sorted out. And so that being polite on the one hand, but saying, please, can you do something now? You know? Chris, Chris, you know, it's interesting when we talk, you know, you made a very important point, which I hope, um, you know, when this even goes out on our YouTube channel that um, even young single mothers or whatever, it doesn't have to have an age with it, but single mothers can actually undertake a nursing course and complete it. Mm. And that's really important. I remember in my first role as an academic at what was Thames Valley University, where we met, and it's now called University of West London, doing an interview. And the candidate said to me, she said, well, I messed up. I got pregnant at 16. And the mm. only job I could have do was care homework. That's all I could have done. Mm -hmm. And then she told us sort of how she fell in love with nursing and now mm -hmm. why she wanted to be a nurse. So mm -hmm. we do know, even, you know, what you're saying is true that, you know, people can become nurses, you know, despite, you know, what their circumstances are. So I think, you know, it, it's really um, interesting, as you say as well. I thought when you talk about the urgency in the letters, when um, your grandfather didn't want your mother to be seen by people because she was beginning mm -hmm. to show. So That's when she right. went to, it was it Birmingham she went to, she, she had to, you know, didn't want her to come back. We can post her close to her if she needs to. Right. Um, yes. It was so poignant, wasn't it? You know, yeah. um, and I, I often compare my memoirs with Philomena, you know, the very mm. well-known account of Philomena who mm. was living in Ireland and uh, in the early 50s. And she was, uh, she just had dreadful, and of course the film that's been made of it as well. Mm. and. I, I, when I was writing that that uh, that Philomena and President Obama's dreams from my father actually were the two key books that you know mm. were in my mind as I was writing because I wouldn't compare myself at all to President Obama but, but <laughs> yeah. some aspects of his life mirrored mm. mine very very closely yeah. when we come to identity issues and mixed race etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but, and Philomena, you know, I just, you know, her story was so tragic, wasn't it, really? Yes, so right. tragic. And and it's like there, but for the grace of whatever, our paths, you know, you just don't know which path you're going to end yeah. up going down, really, do you? That, yeah. that, that's true. I, in, in, I mean, in chapter three of the book also, you write, um, you know, I've written it down here, you wrote about the silence, shame and stigma of your mother's pregnancy mm -hmm. um, with you, you know, because because again, at that time, young women being pregnant. But the other bit is you, you, you then nicely slipped into the book. You said, never mind that your father was black and you were mixed race. It was first the, the, the you know, the stigma, the silence, the shame, because um, her siblings, your, which is your aunt and they, they didn't realize your mom had given birth to you, right? That's right, that's right. Yeah. So, and I think this is where, I mean, intersectionality is obviously fairly new to me, Calvin, I'll be, you know, quite honest. Um, but when I started to look into it, I thought, you know, it really does capture so many aspects of my story. You had everything thrown into it, mm -hmm. you know, and bearing in mind, I was born two years after the Second World War had finished <clears throat> and the attitudes and the, the oh, I mean, you know, really. You, you had everything thrown into it. I mean, the fact that my mother couldn't even bring herself to tell her parents or anybody about my father, except that he was a student at Cambridge University. Zilch, nothing. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, I know there's some serious aspects of my, my life, etc. but I do have a sense of humour as well. And I think that's helped me enormously. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard this, and this was sort of oral history that I heard some part of when I was growing up, was that when my mother had had me, uh, and then my grandparents came to the mother and baby home to visit my mum and me for the first, me for the first time, and this 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 mother and baby home is run by Irish nuns in in in, in Birmingham, and how the the, <laughs> the nun is sort of temporarily blocked my grandparents from coming in to sort of alert them by saying, ah, to be sure the baby's a little dark. <laughs> I mean, I just I just think what I mean, what they must have 
I don't, I don't even think they would have even understood what the nun was trying to tell them. And then on the other, on the other side of that door, on a more serious note, what my mother must have been going through, okay. knowing that any minute now, her parents are going to see this brown skinned baby with an, a huge Afro, by the way. Um, there's no way they're gonna pass this child off as Mediterranean or, you know, in, you know, all the ways in those days, perhaps even today. Oh, she just got a, she's Spanish origin or something. Or, 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 or a GI Joe, not even. <laughs> uh, you know, serious. So what my mother must have been going through as the time was going to come so, so closely now that her parents were going to see me in this court. Mm. Um, and you know, my grandmother before, obviously, she, they'd assumed that, that I would be white from the little my mother had told them, Cambridge <laughs> University student, this has to be, I don't even think they would, they wouldn't have even considered that this baby wasn't going to be white. And so my grandmother had actually, one of her plans was that she would tell the neighbors that this was her baby. This was a late onset pregnancy, so to speak, surprise pregnancy in middle yes, age. Of course. Uh, and, and, and that was, that's not um, so rare, is it? I mean, for those of us that like watching Who Do You Think You Are? Or what's the other program? Called The Midwife and these other and things. And the family, the family. The oh, one when that... they trace the family trees and so yes. forth. Yes. Okay. That, that's, it's not an unusual narrative, is it? Well, even for me, coming from the Caribbean, that's that's not an unusual narrative that, you know, someone will say it's my baby when it's the sister's baby or, you know, yes. etc. Yes. you know, the one who's married and they take that child and grow them up as their own, you know. Yeah. So there, so there that, is the yes. psychological... So that was plan A. That was plan A, Calvin. <laughs> Until... Plan A didn't work, right? <laughs> what is going on here? You know? <laughs> and I just think what all these machination and as I say going back to intersectionality mm -hmm. you know we had class we had gender we had ethnicity uh, education because you know my mother was the first in her family to go to university and you know everything must have come crashing down on on all these individuals who in their own way I've been trying to support my mother you know my grandparents did support my grand did support my mother unlike Philomena, who was sort of mm -hmm. kicked out of the house. And, and also, although some people may read your, your, you know, dreams from my mother and think, well, you know, her father was very quick to, you know, keep going back to the church to cover up this. But it's at that time and in their eyes, they were doing the best. So my grandfather. Daughter. Yes, your grandfather. The, 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 yes. Actually, yes. Oh, I, as I said, I think people really do have to remember it was 1947. Mm -hmm. And uh, the this uh, and the religion. So you've got this Catholicism, you've got this mm -hmm. uh, class. I mean, this is an aspiring mm -hmm. family moving mm -hmm. upwards mm -hmm. because the origins of my mother's family were working class Irish immigrants who mm -hmm. settled in Liverpool. Because I I actually commissioned a genealogist for my mother's mm -hmm. family, and got right back to the 1840s wow. when they and they came over uh, my both my mother my grandmother and my grandfather obviously on my mum's side mm -hmm. th th their heritage was in terms of coming over to Liverpool mm -hmm. in the 1890s you know it's incredible to look back at that and mm -hmm. to try and and that made me understand even more you know everything that they'd work for and the golden child was my daughter, was my mother because she was such a brilliant child. And then it all, you know. So, yeah. you know, Elizabeth, you talk about intersectionality and in academia and certainly some of the work I do around equality, you know, diversity, inclusion stuff. We, we often look at intersectionality through the protected characteristics, but mm. your intersectionality is something really different. You say class where they're aspiring, you know, Mm -hmm. where you have, you know, the Irish immigrants, they're here. So mm -hmm. it, it really shows a different, you know, take on intersectionality as well mm -hmm. of how generally people in society live. But when you look back at, you know, as you say, you know, you said in the book, never mind that your father was black and, you know, uh, et cetera. But how much, if any progress, do you think we've made today surrounding race and women? 
I'm looking at you, at also your mother and her experience because I'm sure your mother. I'm saying I'm sure. I'd like to think your mother wasn't the only young Irish woman who fell pregnant, probably and was you know impregnated by someone who was non-white as such. But mm -hmm. you know, how do you think? Um, you know, today, do you think we've made any progress? Well, I think it's it, <clears throat> it's not so unusual now. I think there's, there was the rarity of it all in 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 the, in the 1940s. We we all know that study Black British history. We know that the Black presence in Britain has got, been here, not quite forever, but an awfully long time. But I think where the difference is, is in, in terms of the size of the Black population. And um, so I, I always have to remind myself, you know, when in comparing what might happen to individuals today, there are still negative. See, you see, I think the bottom line is, Calvin, racism is never going to go away. It's, it's how are we dealing with racism? So I know sort of organizationally, you know, just, just the way you, this, this event was introduced with the, the values of South Bank University mm -hmm. in terms of what is accepted and what is not accepted mm -hmm. in, a, in a webinar like today. Mm -hmm. So you have institutions that, that can actively um, insist on this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what it is, is, so racism is there, and I think it's going to be there forever. The, the issue is, how is it dealt with by organisations, by allies, by people who, who observe racist encounters? And institutions should, should actually have it easier, but we know they're not addressing it as well as they should. Individuals, so for example, how would a white person deal with a racist incident that they observe? And we're seeing quite a lot of the different ways that that happens through social media. Um, some we're happy about and some we're not happy about. Yeah. So I think that to me is the issue of, I think it's naive to, and this is only my personal opinion, Calvin. Sure, I yes, think it's, it's all conversation. <laughs> I think it's naive to think that racism is going to be eradicated. I, I just think there's sadly an instinctive, I, I, I don't know whether it's instinctive or what, but there's a, uh, individuals, some, need to feel that they're better than others and they can hook it on all sorts of things, can't they? Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the color of a person's skin, sadly, is one of the issues that some people hook their ability to feel that they are more superior than another person. Now, I know, you know, education and legislation and all that, you know, yeah, but. Um, so, mm. Yes, yeah, so, so we have that sort of primary, <laughs> the, those primary instincts, as you say. Yeah, I hear yeah. what you say. Um, thank you for that. Um, Elizabeth, in your book, <clears throat> you've talked of some harsh times and some wonderful memories. I um, I chuckled to myself, right? Because I particularly loved the bit with the pressure cooker, with oh. your fear of an exploit. Because my mother also had a pressure cooker, and my really? grandparents, and I, you know, the sort of thing was. So and were you frightened of it, so Calvin? Was did it ever frighten you, or not? <laughs> of course it did. And then you try to open the cooker, the steam, and everything oh, else. Um, I, and I really like, you know, how you describe that, you know. Um, you know, as I say, I too have memories and probably some of the people in the audience here today have memories, but what are some of your fondest childhood memories? Because as you say, you weren't a Philomena and you weren't always, it wasn't always negative for you. No, no. So what were some of your fondest childhood memories? Uh, doing Irish dancing. But, but, I but, don't also... know, but I think John Gilmore is on the call and he might be able to teach me one day. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I, because I love music. I've really... Mm -hmm. You know, but my first, the first music genres that I was introduced to were Irish and English folk music as children, oh, you know, as children, as country, da country dancing mm. in terms, of, but also Irish dancing in particular. And uh, the fact that not only did I enjoy the dancing, but I was good at it. I won medals, darling. I mean, you know, come on, I'm being, <laughs> I'm going to be big headed here. And... <laughs> Of course, as a small child, I didn't realize 
straight away how different it was because I was the only black child in the Irish dancing troupe mm. that was organized by the Irish nuns in the convent. And we had this little Irish dancing troupe. So I used to love getting dressed up in the greenery and, and, and then you'd have a few medals on you. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and the, this just, oh, it was wonderful. But also I'm a bit of a show off. So, you know, to get up onto these stages with my friends and sometimes doing it on my own, doing a, a so you know Irish jig or something on my own, but the music did something to me, Calvin. It really did. I, it it just warms me up. It, it 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 helps. To this day, music helps me enormously. Um, so, and the other aspect that I liked, I was taught to play the piano in the children's home, but I never continued it after I left at the age of nine. So whilst I've never continued with that, I love piano music and so th these are something these are these are things that started off in childhood that that have carried on with me in my life you know great I Elizabeth I, I also um you know from mixed blessings you talked about your fond memories of the nun particularly when you had your eczema and she came and did your dressings you know that That's that right. although it was painful it was also a fond memory because I think compassion and kindness may have been the right word you know well, you found that the fact was that that particular <laughs> nun I didn't actually feel pain when she changed my dressings because she used distraction therapy but what what I would do would look around the sick I think it was a sick bay Calvin I don't know mm -hmm. but I would look and in my child's mind I was looking to see whether the white nun was there or the black nun well all the nuns were white all the nuns were white <laughs> okay. what in my mind I was looking for was the nun who wore the white nuns habit rather than the traditional black habit which all ah, all okay. the nuns all the nuns wore black habits mm. except this particular nun so in my mind i called her the white nun okay and i would peer i would peer around the door to see if the white nun was there if she wasn't i would run away and the reason was because she was the only one that could change my dressings without causing me any pain because she was using distraction therapy as we, we would call it now. What would she do? Now to understand why she made me laugh so much, Calvin, mm. you have to understand, I was, I, I was a child in a very religious environment, a convent. It was a children's home, mm -hmm. it was a convent. It was a Nazareth house children's home. And we were indoctrinated with, for example, that nuns were the brides of Christ. They were very holy women, very holy women. So when this nun used to say words like bottom, I, I mean, come on, as a child, the, the bottom is a rude word. Yeah. And we, I just roar with laughter. And while I was laughing, Calvin, she took that. You know, they, they used to use coal tar paste in those days for eczema, beautifully cooling. Then they'd put the gauze on and then they'd wrap the bandage around, which was wonderful. However, when it was time to take the dressing off, the gauze had now stuck to the skin and the bandage. So these other nuns would just tear the bandage off and the skin would come off and it would be painful and I'd be bleeding and I'd be screaming. Never with this white, white nun, who I discovered just before I left was also something called a nurse. And I, I vowed that I would be like this nun. I couldn't be a nun, Calvin, I'm afraid. <laughs> Faith went out the window, I'm sorry to say. Well, I'm not sorry to say, but it happened. But I wanted to be a nurse because that's what I realized she was also, I was told she was a nurse as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I remember in, in the last book and also in this book, it comes across of your application for entry into the nursing school because that was a little battle to begin with, right? You had a consultant yes. who fought your corner. Well, it was actually a school medical office of health who fought my corner because I left, I had to leave school at 16. I was living with my gran in the mid, they'd rescued me from an abusive stepfather. Let me fast forward. And, mm -hmm. um, but, um, and then I went, anyway, so but around the age of 17 in the Midlands, I was back in the Midlands, I was applying to, to go to London. Cause you know, we, we all wanted to go to London. Well, some of us wanted to go to London, the big mm -hmm. capital, you know. Yes. And I applied to three teaching hospitals and I had seven O-levels. It was, mm -hmm. was O-levels in those days. And 
you know, now I can be big headed about it. At 16, 17, I didn't know I'd done mm. so well in my own levels. But, you know, I had maths, English language, English mm. literature, geography, biology, human. You know, they, these were these were good. Mm. I shouldn't say good subject, but you know what I mean. And yes. I had good grades in seven O levels. Mm. So I had I actually had more. I, I certainly had the educational criteria. Mm. Let's just leave it like that. But I never heard back from these um, schools of nursing. I had to, I, I do remember having to put, well, leaving blank, they wanted to know the name of my father, ah. which I didn't know. And they wanted to know my father's occupation, which I didn't know. And then they wanted a photograph of me. Now, I just put it to you because I never heard back from them. Mm -hmm. And so it's this school medical office of health while I was a school nursing assistant, 16 to 18. He, I'd never seen him get cross, Calvin, ever really mm. nice natured guy but he saw something in me oh I think we'd call him a mentor now wouldn't we mm -hmm. but I saw him get cross because he kept asking me have you heard from them have you heard I was saying that and one day he's what is that a matter with? and I thought I thought he was cross with me I, oh. and then I realized mm. he wasn't he was cross with these hospitals mm. so he then gave me the contact and I got into another I Paddington General mm. so I actually had difficulties initially even getting onto a course a nursing course and that 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 says something, doesn't it? Yes, it, it does. And um, it, for, for those callers on the line who are not from a nursing background, uh, Elizabeth was talking about schools of nursing. So historically, a hospital had a school of nursing attached to it where we weren't educated, but trained as nurses. Mm -hmm. And then as we progress into a profession, we actually then became um, into the university sector where we entered degree diploma and then degree level. So just to clarify to people, at one point, the hospitals had the decisions as such of who were being accepted. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting that they ask for your father's name, because I know some in the history of nursing, we all know you're often asked the profession of your parents as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, and here, you know, you had a, a big stumbling block. So I guess well, that's cut you off. <clears throat> yeah. I, I didn't know. And no, as a child, if nobody talks about something, you know better than to ask. Mm -hmm. So obviously I was curious about my father because gradually I realized mm. I didn't get this brown skin from my mother. Yes. So, you know, I obviously was reasonably intelligent. So at some point the penny dropped. It must have come from my father. But nobody spoke about my father. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I don't want to give it away because other people need to read the book as well on the call. But there are the chapters of, you know, being introduced to your father's family side. Of, yeah. you know. But um. How did you approach that conversation with your mother to say, I want to know about my dad? I wrote, I wrote to her. I, I okay. you know, <laughs> if ever I wanted to find out something, I would put it in a letter. I mean, oh, okay. I, I, I was in London and she was in the Midlands, but I, I did okay. visit her occasionally. Yeah. Didn't visit her that much as a student nurse, I have to say. Yeah. I was preoccupied with my friends in London, as you are, you know, as a young nice. person. But no, I, I it, it was a <clears throat> delicate area, wasn't it? I didn't know how my mom would react. So I just wrote to her and said, look, I was now 24 when I, so it took me till the age of 24 to ask my mother, my father's name, because of course I had my mother's maiden name, which is a, an Irish surname. Mm. And so <clears throat> she sent me the information straight away, literally by return of post. She gave me his information. I mean, I, um, I, I could talk all afternoon, but you know, we're gonna open it up soon for questions from the audience. But, um, Elizabeth, just to end, you know, we know um, for those of us who share that identity of being an ethnic minority, we know how difficult nursing has been and you know, navigating that landscape in this country. But today, I, I don't wanna talk so much about you know, that bit. What has been the highs of your career? today oh, you know yes. what, what would you say you know I know some of them because I know you personally but how would you sum up some of the highs of your career oh I think the biggest high was becoming the first sickle cell nurse specialist mm. in 1979 that that uh, that really should we, was should we just explain to those on the call again who are not from a nursing medical background what is sickle cell really you know because we, we it's a bit it has been in the news again that's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's an inherited blood disorder of the red blood cells. A child inheriting the illness must have inherited it from both parents, but um, those parents. Um... Can you hear this phone ringing or not? 
I just heard a phone ring, but I don't know whose it is. Is it yours? Oh. You can stop it if you like. Do you mind? I... No, it's not at all. Oh, it's the, the person has stopped. So okay, okay. I still haven't got to grips with everything about. <laughs> um, so sorry. Um, so sickle cell anemia is inherited from both parents. And usually those parents are silent carriers of something like sickle cell trait. Okay. But the, 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 the parents then have, every time they have a child, there's a risk 25% chance that each of their children could have the illness. So you could have a family with 10 children with the condition, none of them, it, it's a matter of chance. So a child born with the illness probably won't get symptoms until after the age of six months. And, and it's mainly painful um, pain, uh, susceptibility to infections, and susceptibility to organ damage, such as strokes in young children, Etc. So it can affect virtually every organ of the body. The good news is life expectation has increased uh, significantly. And even better news we've heard recently that in, for this country now, there's a, there's, a, there's a new drug, it's not a cure, and it can't be given to everybody, but it seems as though it will reduce contact with, for example, accident and emergency visits for the individual by just under 50%. So that is really, that, that's, um, winner, that's, right. that's very encouraging, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. It, 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 there are some uh, few mm -hmm. individuals who have been cured of sickle cell anemia through bone marrow transplantation, although they can still pass on the sickle gene, but uh, the bone marrow transplant, if it's successful, um, is, is, has, has worked, yes. So interestingly, just for me to sum that up, Elizabeth, um, something that we're talking a lot about now in this thing is genomics. You were also a genomics nurse because you're talking about gene and, and understanding all of that. So you were doing a bit of genomics even back, you know, then as your, your biggest um, achievements. Um, I'm going to end off now, but two things first. Um, I have known you for so many years and I learned something really new. Um, how is your French, Elizabeth? And is it as good as your ego book? C'est pas mal, c'est pas mal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and your African language is coming on as good as well, because when you Mba, were Mba. Today... <laughs> Mba is no in yeah. Igbo. No. Okay. It, so, it, so if sorry. I had grown up in an Igbo household from childhood, I would be speaking Igbo fluently. I'd love to speak, but uh, whereas in with French, I always found French fascinating. I don't know why. And I had a lovely French teacher. And then I went and lived in Paris and worked in Paris for nine months mm. simply to improve my French. So that explains um, why I don't speak Igbo and why I speak some fairly good French. Fairly, fairly so good um, French. I, I'm going to end right now with this so, and leave the question for the audience. But um, I have been listening to a certain song on repeat lately when I go running. Um, and it's a sort of remix with Elton John and the famous Dua Lipa. Ooh. And you've got a Brit Award. Have you got the Brit Award handy to show us at least? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, prepared, I prepared this earlier for you. Can, can you actually, where I can't, can you see that? Yes, we can see it. We can see it. Wow. That's unbelievable, the, isn't it? Unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable. How did that make you feel knowing that you, and I'm going to end with this question. How oh. did that make you feel? Well, absolutely shocked at it because so again I, some people say to me are you friends with Dua Lipa <laughs> but I do love her singing but I mean I did know of Julie because yeah. as I've said Calvin music is so important to me important to you, yeah. so um I I, I I I do I do I do love I do love her, her, her. she's got a beautiful voice hasn't she, she, has. um, she has. but I it's, it's, <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh really. I should take all this really very seriously. I? But I was watching television, but I wasn't watching the Brits. We forgive and, you. <laughs> and, then, and then somebody rang me to congratulate me. And I said, what? She told me off. She said, Dua Lipa's just giving you a shout out. I said, what? I said, but don't, but, but you must know Dua Lipa. I said, I don't know Dua Lipa. I don't know how Dua Lipa heard about me. But that, that's, you know, a look, it, 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 wasn't it fantastic for nursing? Yes, it is. And I, I, I think that's what she heard. She heard of your contribution to the profession, to nursing, and the great work you have done. And um, certainly when any of us, for me particularly, whenever I have a meeting at St. Thomas's, or even I go running on the river, and it's beautiful. If no one has gone to see it, they need to. It's wonderful if you run in the sunset or at sunrise, and you can just catch the sun coming off that Mary Sickle statue. Oh, um, beautiful. It's beautiful. I can't remember the name of the chap, who was the uh, um, oh, who designed it? 
because um, I was there the unveiling when he did it of this of the miniature. Martin Martin Jennings. Martin Jennings. There you go, Martin oh. Jennings. So we should thank him as well. But oh. I'm gonna. Elizabeth, thank you so much. It's, it's just been wonderful. We can talk all afternoon, but I'm sure the audiences have some questions. So I'm going to pass back to Neil, who will moderate us on questions. Neil, back to you. Give me two seconds. Sure. There we go. So hopefully we can see everyone on the screen now. Yeah, perfect. So, people, so turn their cameras on, yes. people are very welcome to turn their cameras on. Um, so um, Thank you so much. That was so fascinating to listen to you. I could listen to you all afternoon. Um, oh, it's thank quite you. wonderful. Um, we are going to open up for questions. And um, if you have a question, please, uh, this is nice and informal. We're, we, we want open conversation and dialogue. So please just pop your cameras on um, if you'd like to ask a live question and signal to me that you'd like to ask one. Um, alternatively, you can put your questions in the Q&A box, uh, in the chat box, sorry, um, if, you'd rather, if you'd rather not feature in the recording. Um, and Ish, I can see that you have raised your hand, so I'm going to come to you first. If anyone else on screen would like to ask one, just, just let me know. Mish, over to you. So I've got a sticky... Can you hear me? It's a sticky yes. unmute <laughs> button of yes, mine. We can hear you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was so good. I think I'm stalking you for Black History Month. I'm seeing you in different places at the moment um, but can I ask you this question that's on my mind at the moment and it is to do with um, equity and all, all the things that are coming up in the NHS with organizations and new initiatives that are coming into play to try and improve um, circumstances for BME staff and service users. Uh, what advice would you give them so they don't end up recycling the same thing and coming to the same point of little change? Because I, I kind of worry that are we just doing the same things again? Um, and it was really refreshing to, to sort of talk to Anton Emmanuel from the RES and where he's going with the data. But I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, really. So are you, I'm, I'm not sure, I, are you talking about the sort of NHS policy people, NHS? Um... So the House Observatory has come oh, into okay. play, hasn't it? So... so, okay, yeah. Well, I think, I think, again looking back and trying to compare the situation when I started out and now in retirement just watching ob observing I have to be honest on the whole due to COVID blah 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 um, I think one of the positives that has happened is that we we certainly have got more data there's no need for people to be constantly saying oh well we need to research this we need to research that the data is there and also what's different is there's an impatience quite rightly with people to say we don't want to be researched anymore thank you very much do something with the evidence that you've already got and in a sense the the, the res which um, remind me what does it stand for race equality the workforce, what does the w race equality workforce strategy. thank you workforce race equality scheme i think one of the things that um please me about what was happening there was that every first of all it's mandated that people do provide this this information the trust so there's no excuse there really isn't any excuse for a trust to say well they didn't realize that um members of black let's say black staff uh, weren't doing as well because it's a year on year comparison they can see they can actually see whether there's any improvement in career progression, for example, within their, their trust. So they're really, there's no excuse to say, we didn't know. What the issue is now is what are they doing about this? And it really, from an individual point of view, it, it's, it's when I say it to them and us, I don't mean necessarily in a battle mode, but the data's there, People are in charge, have got the, the uh, power to do something about it, the resources possibly. And then people individually say, well, what can they do? Well, you know, I, I, I just say, as an individual, 
it's very difficult to do something on your own within a, within a trust. Personally, and this is only my personal, this is what's helped me, helped me, was being a member of a trade union and also being a member of a professional organization, both actually, because I need, and then specific networks, for example, uh, black groups with a particular interest. Mine was sickle cell. Because one of the things I forgot to mention, Calvin, in talking about sickle cell was the origins of sickle cell is where falciparum malaria is. And whilst white people can get it, in this country, it's predominantly people of African Caribbean origin who have sickle cell, but others can, can, can inherit it. So I found that linking in with like-minded groups, groups I'm talking about, um, and trade union and professional organizations would be the sort of uh, conduit, the, the, the way to pour forth some, a few of the issues that I wanted change. Because you can't deal with it all. You'll have a nervous breakdown. You choose your battles and you choose who you fight those battles with and who you're fighting those battles against. And also when things have progressed, you actually feed back to those organizations, individuals, power people who you have been battling with and challenging with. And you do give them a pat on the back when actually progress is made. I'll give you a quick example with sickle cell. Um, when the, the introduction of newborn screening in this country for every baby, regardless of ethnic origin, listen, that was revolutionary. So you feed back. This is good. This and we and we want more of this. Yeah, but thank not thank you because we're not pleading, but actually to acknowledge this is the sort of progress we want, because what I gradually realised was that those people in power that scared stiff of people that are different to them and people that challenging them. Well, I didn't realise that when I was young. I gradually realised that. So I don't know whether I'm just throwing things out that help me gradually understand the culture of the NHS, for example, and the constant change. And whether we like it or not, we feel that we can have made progress and then that progress can go backwards. We saw it with the COVID pandemic, we, we are still seeing it, but we definitely saw it quickly with the COVID pandemic, didn't we? How it, you know, it disproportionately affected black and minority health workers, black and minority ethnic patients. I mean, that just, it just came up so quickly. Um, so I'm, I, I think I'll finish there that I could sure. go on and on. I'm, I'm sure afraid, we have other questions. I'm sure helpful. we have other questions, Elizabeth. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Thank, Thank you. you, Mish. Thank you, Mish. Uh, would anyone on screen like to ask a question? Uh, Peter, over to you. Oh. Hi, hi, Dame Elizabeth. Um, Hello, Peter. Hi, uh, uh, I heard you speak once before, uh, and I don't know why, but uh, some people who speak, maybe their voice, maybe the way they, the way their intonation, it's just so inspiring and moving. Um, and I think you're one of them. Uh, I'm, I used to, I, I, well, I am still a member of Unison Black Workers, and you came to speak at our Unison Black Workers, um, one of our events before. And now I work for Hampton and Fulham Council as a race lead. Uh, two, two things. Number one, I've just bought your book just now, talking to you, uh, listening to you. So I've just you. went on and bought with it. So I'm gonna. And the second thing is, um, I'd like you, if possible, at some stage to come and give a talk at, at Hammersmith Council, because we're doing Black History 365. I know I'm rambling throughout the year. So if, if we could have some details, that would be absolutely super fabulous. But but my question is, Dame Elizabeth, is um. Growing up as a young person um, and going up through what you went through with, 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 with schooling and, 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 and parents and the thought patterns that was running around your head when you were five and six and seven and eight, what kind of, um, did you ever, and looking at all other people and thinking maybe they're a little bit different to me, what did you ever, did you ever feel that you wished you were like them or were you happy to be like you are or and 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 did and how long did that take to just gradually smooth itself away that was my oh, question I can, peter i can answer that mm. and, and you will be able to read it in the memoirs as well but I, I can answer that very very easily 
because when I was in the children's home, and I think I was probably about five or six, so I, you know, you can't re remember the exact age. I washed my face 10 times with red carbolic soap and ended up in sick bay because I have eczema. And that was because I was the only black child just until I left the convent at the age of nine. I don't actually remember any other black children, but I do remember a nun telling me a black child was, was another black child was coming to, 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 to live in the children's home. So I think that answers your, 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 your question, the first part of the question. Oh, yeah, I just knew gradually I was different and I didn't want to be different. I wanted to be white like my friends. Fast forward to when did I feel at ease with who I was? There's no doubt that it was when I met my father. I found my father and I found him very, very quickly, surprisingly. That is, that is a story in itself, which is in the book. Um, but I was nearly 25. And I knew my father for eight years before he died. And I went to Nigeria. And I, well, first of all, I, I met my Nigerian, part of my Nigerian extended family in London, because they were there. I didn't, obviously I didn't know before till I found my father, who happened to be in London temporarily, thank goodness, when I did find him. And then when I started to go out to Nigeria, um, I just, there was, there was, um, What's that expression that you call it? Um, light bulb moment, light bulb moment. Uh, and this is where it's similar to President Obama's narrative in his first memoirs, Dreams from My Father, was I'm all right, I like myself. Yeah. And it, it, it's, the, it's those people over there who think that my skin is there's something wrong with me because I'm brown. It's they, they've got problems. I haven't got problems. And I mean, I, I think it was also what was going on. I'm, I'm a very curious person. And so I'm very grateful to what I was able to follow um, from the civil rights era in the United States and visit there as well. And then following what was happening to President Mandela because before his release and his writings, um, Long Walk to Freedom, for that man to say he's prepared to die for his cause. I mean, you know, then I, re it's sort of, these were light bulb moments. Well, if I think I've got problems, look at what Nelson Mandela's going through. Do, do, yeah. So all of those were very influential. The fact that I loved reading, um, the writers that I eventually came across. Franz Fanon's book was the first book of a writer of color. And that was recommended to me by a, a French Benin midwife when I was in Paris, when I told her the story of washing my face 10 times. She said, read Frantz Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks, and Peter Odoying. That, that was so influential. And that was actually before I met my father. So I think that Frantz Fanon's book and then meeting my father were the two key things that helped me. Yeah. Thank you, Dame Elizabeth. And I'm hoping that we could if I give the moderator some details, maybe he could help me get your email or I could just write to you from the council or something. Please yeah. to come and no, do I'm sure um, Calvin will give, pass on my details. And um, mm -hmm. as, I, I'm only doing online at the moment because I don't like that's this that's, COVID. <laughs> don't that's mind. fine. We're, we're doing the same. We're doing the same. So thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. If you can email me, I'll make sure your details are passed on. Um, John, we'll come to you next and then Tony will come to you and then Sonia. Thanks so much. Thanks, Neil, and, and, and thanks so much to Calvin. Like two, you are two of my favourite people on Twitter, so it's always great to hear Elizabeth speak and, and, and also Calvin. I'm re I was really taken by your discussion around I obviously I'm Irish, so obviously I get I get no, on those no. kinds of conversations. <laughs> but I'm really interested in, I mean, that kind of that that mixed identity and that and that heritage and history. And I'm thinking about like some of my students now who are black Irish students and mm -hmm. despite having a long history and I was up a, bit recently, a long history of, of people of colour and, and black people in Ireland they're they so hidden and even now today there are very few role models and for lots of my students when I engage with them they don't want to engage with a heritage conversation they want to engage with a with a here and now but unfortunately I think in nursing we're still lacking that leadership we don't have very many 
black or, 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 or any people of color in higher kind of management positions or leadership positions and very few in academia as well. So I suppose it's kind of thinking about how to kind of steer or support or, or bring those students along or, or, those, or those young people I'm engaging with to, to see that. And I'm quite conscious of me being a white man doing that is quite, is quite difficult, but it's that who is the person I can, I can present them to. And again, it's thinking about a lot of those people who I know are from the UK because that's where I worked for many years. Um, so I'm not sure there is, but I think when you start talking about Fanon and, 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 and reading Mandela's work and reading other work, reading your memoir, you know, it's maybe that's the maybe that's the point. It's it, it's reading and 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 seeing the solace young people can get in in text or in documentary. Or I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I babble a bit. Yeah, well, I think I think I, we're all we're all on a journey, aren't we? But I just wish that what I would wish for is that um, students, your students, for example, have a faster transition into that journey than I did. Um, and I think it it's pointing. If they will accept it to resources that you, you you flagged up because it's not necessarily books it could be youtube videos it, 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 there's, there's such a, an array of um platforms now that can suit students regardless of for example if they're dyslexic or, or, or whatever might be the challenges it might be psychological that there's there's there's, an, there's this initial barrier because it's been painful, the journey that some of them have been on, and they are wary uh, of, you know, all sorts of people. And, and there's a reason why that happens. So um, mm. interestingly, though, I, I found it helpful, and I think I do talk about this in, in my memoirs a bit, the, the, the similarities in terms of the Irish journey, well, no, not the Irish journey, the Irish relationship with Britain, and the Nigerian relationship with Britain, the similarities and differences, and the impact that it's had on an, in, or, or, or the impact that it probably has had once I get to know about it on somebody like myself. So the, you have to learn about these things, and you, you're not taught you're not taught about them necessarily in school. Um, and if you are, there might be a biased way that it's presented to you. So I think self learning. It, it, but you can't force self-learning on. I think it's something has to happen to individuals to sort of, and, and it's possibly meeting somebody or watching a film on television or, and they think, hold on, that resonates with my life. I mean, Barack Obama's Dreams from My Father and uh, really had a, a huge impact on me because I'm thinking, wow, you know, he went through very similar uh, sort of, issues um, that I've gone through, which I hadn't, I hadn't actually realized until I read his memoirs, to be quite honest. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know whether that's answered it, John, but. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tony, we'll come to you next. My technology. <laughs> Thank you, Dame Elizabeth. Hello, we Thank we you. know each other. We and certainly do. I am aware of all the the things bestowed upon you <laughs> for all the, the work you've done. And I want to see if you could open up with me something I think when Calvin mentioned to you about attracting people into the profession, and I was thinking people, you know black people, all the varieties we have. I'm thinking your wealth of um, nursing, situations that have happened with you is, is, a, is a leadership position and also a role model and an example. And perhaps um, it, it wouldn't be so much um, the, the awful things that have happened and I've experienced some too, but mm. the other side to encourage people to enter the profession, yes. um, which I think, you know, you, I would like to see what you think you could do. I give you an example of what I did about last year. <laughs> I, I had to go to the hospital for things to be done. And there was a male nurse, a black male nurse. And I got into conversation with him and my, my, my theme was to say to him, don't you have many other friends to attract him <laughs> to do the job? And then he told me why and how and when and where, but he took the seed 
and said, you know, I know the conversations people have, but you're saying to me, I should do this. Perhaps I should and mm. get a few people in. So just, the, you know, just the thought. Yes. You know. Well, I, I think, um, Tony, I, I think the contribution I've made is through my memoirs. Now, as I've said, not everybody wants to read a book. Come on, we, we, we know the issues with literacy. It's not just necessarily literacy. It's the form that we know there's different platforms that people appreciate more verbal, you, you know better than me. And so that's one of the reasons I'm very pleased that I was able to do the audio book. So it, it, because I think people have to just either listen or read about yeah. somebody's life to find yes. out they might get some clues or hints or ideas as to why my life went one way when it could have easily gone another way and i i i know that the main reason is that i had people looking out for me yes. i also yes. had my own intelligence which it did take me a bit of time to sort of accept that i'm quite intelligent it's also that um I've so sort of people looking out for me and my own efforts as well that mm -hmm. you know it is hard work we it's no yep. good skirting around it yep. you know better than anybody with all your experience with students and others hard work is involved mm -hmm. but um but they've got to have a that has that hard work has to be at times enjoyable even though at times yes. it's not yes. and also yes. it's got to have it's got to be worthwhile. What what's at the end of that rainbow, if we like, or the tunnel, or whatever you know description? You could, why should I work this hard? What what? How will it help me in my life if I do work harder than maybe I am working hard? And, so, and, and, yeah. mm. and as you mentioned, fulfillment. Um, mm. What is it? You know, and how mm. can I? share this with people so for them to understand you might not have the salary but what is this thing we talk about as fulfillment and being compassionate so that people can see how they might yeah work yeah, yeah. And well i've a got a paragraph like Sorry, you. Got, yes. yeah i have a paragraph or so in the memoirs which yes. is why i've been attracted to nursing and what i've loved about nursing and that is the the, the opportunity you, you have to make somebody uh, feel better or yeah. feel more comfortable yeah. Yeah. with this yeah. with because of whatever illness it is or whatever because of course I've both been in the hospital the acute and, and in the community mm -hmm. so there's both the health promotion as well as the mm -hmm. um actively so it's primary secondary tertiary care obviously or all, all of that and yeah. and just the delight and the, the and it is fulfillment that I've gained yeah. by just yeah. making somebody feel feel a bit better regardless of how ill they might be and also to think about the fact that I always think about when I've not been well how much better I feel when somebody's looking after me either yeah, you know realizes yeah. I need a drink I mean if we go back to sickle cell anemia yes the, the expertise of nursing care is to recognize when somebody looks dehydrated because immediately you're thinking if they're dehydrated they're going to sickle more they're going to get more pain so you can actually just and i would say to um individuals that i say you know you look your lips look very dry i don't you you appear to be a bit dehydrated and they sort of look oh. at you sort of oh really you saw that did you and that is nursing knowledge isn't it you're That's so nice. rich it's it's a delight to for you to have this platform and for us to hear about it and i hope other people will, will get a chance through youtube or whatever to to hear yes how you deliver and the sort of ideas you have because Thank it's you. a rich theme which i would like to capture and teach the next generation oh, thank you very much <laughs> thank, thank you thank you, thank you. We are recording this event and it will be shared on YouTube with everyone who registered and everyone who everyone who couldn't attend um, because we do like our events to have impact beyond just the events themselves and um, particularly in light of what Elizabeth has shared this evening. Um, Sonia, we are going to come to you next. Ooh, hello. Hi. Let me, okay, I've switched my camera on. I hope it's come up. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, good afternoon. and, and uh, greetings, uh, Dame Elizabeth. Um, I want to be really sneaky and ask two questions, actually, <laughs> uh, but stop me if you don't want me to, because um, they're, they're two very 
different questions. Um, so the first question is, and, and I, I'll just say that um, I chair the Croydon Sickle Cell and Thalassemia oh. Support Group which is a, a, a registered charity. And we are fortunately co-located with the specialist uh, clinical nurses and we've, we've been there for a long time. Um, so the first of my two questions is, um, we've just been doing some work with our members around the very sensitive issue of family planning. And um, those awkward uh, conversations that people living with sickle cell have to have when they're starting to think about uh, families. And I wonder, um, Dame Elizabeth, whether you have any tips around the kinds of ways we can um, get our members to introduce that conversation, because although the figure for people living with sickle cell has remained kind of uh, kind of static um, at around 15,000 for the last few years. I, I, I do believe those numbers are increasing and, and maybe it's just around collating that information. And so one of the things we've, we've come up, we've spoken about in our group meetings is how do we, how do we get our young people to have that conversation um, before they start the family? So that's the first question. What, what are your thoughts on or any tips on that? I'm not sure I've quite... <laughs> I think you're going around, <laughs> around in circles a little bit with me here. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you saying how do you approach the question of family planning to individuals with sickle cell disease? Is that what you're asking me? No, not? it's for them right, themselves. Right. So it's for them how they broach that. So, OK, I have, I have the trait or I have sickle cell. How mm -hmm. do they introduce that as a conversation with their the person who they're hoping to start the family with if it's not come up before because what we've all in speaking to our members who already have children the first thing they say is I never thought about asking my partner whether they also had the tray oh. and obviously now it's too late because they've started the family so with some of our younger members we're trying to say to them how will you have this conversation with your potential partner um, who you are hoping to co-parent with? And they've all said, I've got no idea how I'm going to have this conversation because, you know, I'm well with my sickle cell or it's manageable. It's not been a problem. And I've not really thought about, you know, when I get to that part in this relationship with this person, whether I'm actually, you know, how I'm going to pass that on, how I'm going to have that conversation with them before we have any children. Well, I think it centers on at what stage they feel comfortable in sharing with their partner, first of all, that they have sickle cell disease and that it is inherited. And that even though they have sickle cell disease, it doesn't necessarily mean that their children will have sickle cell disease. It depends on what their partner hemoglobin status hemoglobin mm -hmm. just their status is so i think that i think that the, the converse in my experience when i was involved with sickle cell it the first question that was at the top of their mind uh, affected by the illness is first of all can i have children mm -hmm. bearing in mind i was i was working in the 80s so uh, you know there was some Am I allowed to have children? That's why I'm saying, uh, uh, hopefully people mm -hmm. will ask, because it, 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 there, there were people who were saying to them, and I think it still does happen occasionally, we, I don't think you should have children. I think, you know, you're really lucky to have survived this long and, you know, it's gonna be really dangerous and da, 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 da. And, and therefore the fact that the individual wanted to, instinctively wanted to have children and yet felt that they couldn't, talk about this to their healthcare practitioners or their family even mm -hmm. it's the it's the conversation that individual has with the health professionals as they're growing up with this condition that they would understand the inheritance pattern for how it affects their reproductive journey so that when they have a partner this is something that they can then explain when they're comfortable to do that mm -hmm. to, and have a discussion with their partner. Because first of all, the partner needs to understand he or she or could contribute the sickle gene to their child, but they wouldn't know that unless they've been tested. 
Yeah. So it's, so it's like it's the logical steps in the conversation. And there's there's material on the Sickle Cell Society website about this. There are videos. There's a there's a beautiful video of a a, 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 a play originally, I think. I can't remember the name of the, the film now, but it's on the society website. And it's, uh, it's a West African family where how do they introduce to their partner the fact that they actually have the illness and mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the genetic possibilities in terms of if they were to have children? So I think that's that's the you've got to go right back to yeah. the individual with the illness. And so they take much, they have to take the responsibility for well, um, opening up. Yeah, and they may need support with that because it's it's huge. Mm -hmm. And you know, I can this fear of even revealing that they've got the condition to their partner, because sure, you know, they'll be frightened that this partner, well, hey, you know, bye-bye, <laughs> yeah. I'm off, you know. See you later. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's not just people with the illness, it's people with the trait. When are they, yes. when, if, are they going to discuss that they've got a trait with their partner? Mm -hmm. That's that's the difficult stage. That is the, yeah. and that's where they need support for, for yeah. They, they're going to be worried about rejection and they've experienced rejection throughout their lives because of their condition or they may have mm -hmm. and so they need some support uh, um yeah yeah that's definitely come up a few times in in members meetings so it's interesting to hear your your take on it uh, my second question and i know that you're not in you know nursing now but um whether you'd be familiar with coordinate my care no, I'm not. 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 Okay, because the question was, it's 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 like a new app. <laughs> um, so they've got the 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 patient online access, so you can book your appointments and everything through this app now. And they've got this new app called Coordinate My Care, which was primarily used a lot for cancer patients. But it's about how people are treated when they attend hospital. So it's an urgent care plan which is kept online, so it's digital, and um, we were trying to look at ways of using that for people with sickle cell because um, we're obviously getting this drip drip of reports of people living with sickle cell who have not been treated properly in A&E and it's resulted in either long term damage or death. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the tools we thought would be useful is to try and jump on the back of this coordinate my care so that when they present at A&E, it's, mm -hmm. it's all there, just open this app and just read oh. what you need to do to me and for me and then uh, we won't Sonia. have any more of this. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. But I, I, are you in are you in contact with John James, the chief exec of the Sickle oh, yeah, Society? Yeah, yeah. Because he, I think yeah. he would be the best person to because of his links. And also, as you quite rightly said, Sonia, sadly, because of the tragedies and, and avoidable deaths. Let's let's just put it on the table. The word. Avoidable yeah. deaths that have occurred in 20 from I, I'm thinking of those individuals from 2019, so before COVID, Evan yes. Nathan Smith. Yep. Um, to uh, right up until recent, we've had a, a, another sad death um, in in northwest London yep. th just a few months ago. Coroner's yeah. inquest has just made it public. So I, I that, that's why I was wondering. It, and and John is liaising with all sorts of organisations now. Mm -hmm. Well, not he was before, but you know we've had the good news about the new medication. But we've also had this very sad, tragic news about um, deaths that shouldn't have happened. So John is, is, as you can imagine, he's in active dialogue with many uh, NHS agencies and nursing groups, for example. So that's why I'm saying perhaps link up with John about your mm -hmm. idea, because um, I think it could be taken further well, through, I, through I those channels, that. through those channels. Okay. I'll definitely do that. Thank you. And yeah. and just just to finish off, we've uh, uh, we've 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 just picked up your books so and we're doing reading it for our book club now. Um, I've answered <laughs> I've answered your your email by the way. So when you, <laughs> yeah, the, we, the we'll be enjoying it. Uh, the, the answer's yes, Sonia. All right. So we. we've okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for your you. question, Sonia. Um, if, there, if there are no more questions, um, I am going to hand over to Calvin 
um, for closing remarks. Um, but just before I do, um, I've popped in our remaining upcoming events for Black History Month 2021 at LSBU um, in the chat box. Do check them out. We have some fantastic events coming up. Um, shout out for, to, um, to Black History Walks who are joining us tomorrow. Um, but especially uh, we have a World Menopause Day slash Black History Month event um, with the wonderful Karen Arthur taking place on Monday, all around celebrating life after 50, after 50. And Karen will be talking about the importance of using your voice and taking up your space. Um, so do check those out. There is something for everyone. Dame Elizabeth, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for your questions. And Calvin, I'll hand over to you for closing. All right. Thank you, Neil. And thank, thank you, Neil. you. First of all, thank you everyone for attending. Um, you know, it's been really wonderful. We can continue the conversation on social media. Elizabeth is as active as I am on social media. Um, and we do have conversations. It's nice to see that I think, Elizabeth, both you and I were probably talking to Sonia this morning about her book club in Croydon that's and right. to see her here. So, so that's the power of social media. So yes. thank you, Sonia, for joining us. Um, Elizabeth, what's left for me to say is thank you very much. It's been, as Tony said, you, you've got all of this knowledge and experience and you've just, it's just a really a snippet of what you are and who you're about that we've learned from today. But your memoirs certainly share more and I enjoyed reading it. Um, as I say, there's some bits that I resonated with, like the pressure cooker. And then, you know, when you met your father's family and, you know, all the little conversations that took part in that whole cultural nuance of, you know, how things were done probably slightly different to the Irish family. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, it's nice to have people far and wide. Dr. Gilmore all the way from Ireland joined us. So it was really good. Um, <clears throat> and all I would say is I hope, and I smirk, I think you know what I mean. I hope our, we're going to have a continued relationship with you, Elizabeth, here at LSVU. And I look mm -hmm. forward to hopefully having you very soon back at LSVU. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for your time and for everyone for attending. And thank you, Calvin. It's been delightful as ever. <laughs> thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you.